Hallelujah. I want to thank everybody who, uh, who organized our anniversary celebration last week. Good time, right? Can you give it up for them, please? A funny thing happens at Revival Life. Normally, in most churches across uh, the country, the week after Easter is the lowest attended service of the year. And so that's why they normally have a guest preacher, because, you know, it hurts people's hearts to see the church full on Easter and empty on the week after. But since we have a barbecue on the week after, everybody sticks around, and the week after that for us becomes a dip. And so everybody's on vacation this week. Hey, you were killing it on the bases today. That was, on the base. That was a good job. Good job. Killing it. It was rocking there. I was, I was enjoying that. But thank you, everybody, who... Uh, who worked on that anniversary celebration. Also, uh, we had another anniversary, the Thomases, not these Thomases, but those Thomases had their fifth anniversary, and that Thomas right there had their fifth anniversary. Give it up. Yeah, yeah give it up. Such an important part of our house. And uh, last but not least, I know he doesn't want me to say this, but my son finishes high school this week. When I first started this as an outreach, he had a role here. It was Captain Helpful. <laughs> He was remarkably not helpful for being the captain of it, but, uh, but he grew up in revival. He grew up, there would be bodies laid out everywhere, and he put on one of these, well, we had green ones then, one of these prayer cloths on his, sh on his hood, on, as a hood, and he'd just jump over people, calling himself Captain Helpful, and it was pretty, it was cute when, you know, he was five or six at the time, which was cute, 18 wouldn't be as cute, right? You know, we all were little kids at one point, but let's not try, and um, oh, so I'm so proud of him. <clears throat> So proud of him. Yeah, yeah, no, I am. <laughs> you know, um, many of you know my story that I didn't, I didn't finish high school. I only finished the ninth grade. And so uh, when my kids ask me for help with their homework, I'm like, oh, man, I don't know. <laughs> ask me about prom. I'm like, yep, don't know. They didn't have that in the ninth grade, so I uh, can't help you with that. Right? I got my GED, and uh, I'm a proud GE holder. They said that they have, like, a graduation ceremony. I'm like, really? Why? No, you can just mail it to me. That's fine. Um, and, um, but, you know, my experience, you know, shaped how I viewed education for much of my life. And um, it's funny about how much of the vision God gives us, we look through the lens of our experience and our expectations. Does that make sense? What God tells us, we like to think that we believe it to be true and we hear him perfectly and that his word is pure. But the truth is, we view what he speaks to us through the lens of experience and expectation. And like I said, I, um, I, I, I had a really not a great uh, childhood, um, not great. Like, uh, how, how long are we going to play with that bag, honey? What's, what's going on here? What's, what's, I love you. I like to tease my wife publicly, unfortunately. That was really, will you forgive me for that? Will you forgive me? Do you forgive me? I'm so sorry. Amen. All right. I was teasing her. Then I was like, oh, I'm teasing her publicly. That makes me a jerk. So sorry about that. Uh, anyways, <laughs> hey, you sin publicly, you got to repent publicly. Amen? That's, how, that's what we teach her. And so, um, <clears throat> and so because school went so poorly for me uh, in my young age, I never thought that I would go to college. Like I just... Because to me, school was depression, school was failure, school was not meeting expectations, school was anxiety, school was feeling out of place, school was just like, you know, not a good time in my life, and uh, school itself didn't go well. And so anytime I thought of it, I thought there was no possible way that I could go to college because school went so poorly. And um, there was a time... Uh, when I, you know, I joined the military, as many of you know, uh, I was in the military and I had a friend who was in community college and uh, I was helping them study. And I remember it was a, um, it was a uh, criminal justice class and they had these flashcards and I was helping them study for their criminal justice class on the flashcards and they weren't getting it. And I couldn't understand why they weren't getting it because it seemed all fairly simple to me. And so I would ask them the thing and they'd say no. And I didn't have, and it got, you know, pretty quickly I didn't have to look at the back of the card to say no, this is the RICO Act. I'm not sure what we're missing here. It's what the entire chapter is on. I don't understand what the problem is. And so as I was like helping them not learn, I was learning and I also learned like, wait a minute, if this is a college class and I can actually learn this, maybe I could go to college. I want you to hear this. My experience in that moment changed my vision for what was possible for me in the future. 
right? My experience up till then had shaped the vision for my life, right? But once I had a new experience, now all of a sudden the vision was shifting because my experience and my understanding and my expectation changed. I knew that if I at least took this class, I could pass it, right? Because I knew that, does this make sense? And so we don't realize this, but when God speaks to us, we often, well, let me say it even more than that. We normally view it through our expectation and our experience. We get the vision that God gives us, and since we have a limited understanding, we jam the word into our understanding. We shoehorn it into our understanding. And so it means often, if we're not careful, the word from God means the thing that I want is going to happen. Without, without the realization that there's actually an other one who is speaking the word. And the other one has his vision for my life as well. I have a vision for my life, and Jesus has a vision for my life. And often when we hear God, we try to figure out how that word fits into our vision. Right? And so uh, today we're going to read out of the, the book of Mark, and I, we're going to do kind of like an old-fashioned Bible study uh, and at the end, I'm just going to have some prophetic application as it applies to our house as a whole. We're in our series, This Is Us. It's a two-week series. Last week, if you didn't listen, I really, really encourage you, if you're part of this house, I would uh, really ask you uh, to go online and listen or watch that message because uh, it really talks about the six, six things that are super, super important to us. Uh, that kind of guide what we do and why we do it. And uh, this week, I'm going to finish it up with kind of a teaching uh, and a little prophetic application. It, it, can we do that? Yeah. We good with that? So uh, go ahead and open your, your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 2, if you would. And um, Mark, uh, the book of Mark, uh, used to be thought as kind of like uh, the book of Matthew's a little stepbrother, not quite as good as Matthew through many of the years. Matthew was the important one. Mark was kind of like kind of like the, the Johnny come lately, uh, they later found out that Mark was, most theologians these days believe, uh, that Mark actually was the first gospel that was written. Uh, and if you look at it, it's, it's kind of a consensus now among theologians that uh, John Mark wrote the book of Mark, and many believe, and I believe this to be true as well, uh, he was a disciple of Peter. As you, as you read the Bible, he was a disciple of Peter. He heard how Peter taught about Jesus in his preaching, in his teaching, in his travels. And, and Mark traveled with Peter as he preached. And after Peter passed away, John Mark began to write down the teachings of Peter. Now, some of us look at the Bible as if uh, a man held a pen but Jesus actually did the writing. Holy Spirit actually guided the pen, and every single dot and tittle was, was absolutely intended by God. But the Bible is actually written by people under the inspiration of Holy Spirit, right? And so it, it's, not, um, it's not to be worshipped, it's to be studied. It's not a replacement for God, it is to help us know God. We like to say at Revival Life Church, we don't follow the Bible, we follow Jesus. And we study the Bible to learn more about Jesus, Right? And so um, this, this part of Mark is not actually written in a chronological order, as it were. It wasn't, you know, the first chapter of Mark uh, is the beginning, and the last chapter of Mark is the end. But in between, it's not like year by year, like the book of Acts. At this part of Mark, as we start in Mark chapter 2, there's five stories that go through Mark chapter 2 and into the beginning of Mark chapter 3. And the five stories show five conflicts that Jesus had uh, with leaders of the day, or just had conflicts. And uh, I wasn't going to share that bit of information. I thought, what a great message series that might be, five conflicts, and then talk about the five uh, stories over five weeks. I thought that would be amazing, but I'm never going to do that, so I thought I can go ahead and share that information now. I won't be spoiling it for later. All right, are you with me? Are, are we all together at this point? Yeah, see, now I'm going to need you to participate and actually answer my questions when I ask. That's going to help me as a preacher. Since so many people are on vacation, I need to know that you're not actually here, but on vacation. That's when you would have responded right there. That was your moment right there. That was the open door. You used to walk through and let the preacher know, I am here with you today, pastor. Yeah. All right. Good, 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 good. Because I'm not going to do a lot of yelling today because I'm going to do a fair amount of teaching out of the Bible. So we're going to read this story out of Mark chapter 2, uh, and starting in verse 1. The Bible says, <clears throat> now, I'm talking about Jesus here, 
when Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were, were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware of his spirit, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed in glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Can you say amen to the reading? Amen. Are you just encouraged by that story? I just get encouraged just reading that story. I feel like I'm ready to go change the world just listening to that. I am ready. Uh, what, what, I, what I want you to do is, as we're in our This Is Us uh, series here, um, I want to I talk a little bit. Uh, about what this particular story means to me, and hopefully in a prophetic sense, it can kind of awaken something in you. I was at a meeting, uh, and there was a well-known prophet uh, there, and uh, his name's Bobby Connor. And Bobby Connor isn't like an, uh, a Facebook prophet. He's like a real prophet, right? Like, he's, like people who are prophets call him a prophet, right? Like, like he's, there, there's, you understand there's prophetic people, and then there's prophets, right? And you understand that there's different levels of authority within, within every ministry. Uh, and there's something on this guy that's, like, his stories will freak you out. Can I just, can I just leave it at that? Like, just, just the, this, the stories are amazing, super prophetic. And I was in the meeting, and the meeting, if I could be very honest with you, uh, were, were incredibly boring. And they were boring because the way that he would preach is he would say something and then quote a scripture and then say a sentence and then quote a scripture, and then talk about that scripture, like, isn't that great, isn't that such a wonderful promise? And then he'd say another sentence, and then he'd recite another scripture. And he did that for about, I don't know, a hundred Bible verses. And I love the Bible, I also like preaching, right? I like a message. And he just went on and on and on, and I was sitting there wondering, why am I here? Because coming to the meeting, I said to the Lord, listen, I'm not looking for another prophetic word. I don't know about you, I'm not looking for a prophetic word. I'm, I'm not shut off to the prophetic ministry on any level, but I already have enough words I'm not fulfilling, right? There's enough promises in my life that are not coming to pass. I just feel like I don't need more. Like, just the disappointment and level of failure in my life right now, I'm at a cap at this moment, right? I, get, I just don't need more at this time. So I don't shop for a prophetic word. If the Lord has one for me, I'm more than happy to receive it. But I did, early in my walk, I'd be pulling on the prophet. Like, you're gonna give, if you're going to give anybody a word, you're going to give me a word, right? Like, that was, now I'm like, I'm good. Like, I am, like, I'm learning my lesson on that one, right? Uh, and so, like, if God wants to tell me something, so what I did pray was, I said, Lord, if you have a scripture, just a scripture that I can meditate on, I have found that when the Lord will speak a scripture as you read the Bible, as a scripture pops off, man, you need, you need to write that one down, and you just pray that one until it comes alive, right? Like, until you fully get it. And um, so I just asked the Lord for a scripture, which is funny, because I forgot that I had prayed that, because... Uh, because Bobby Connor called me out. Now, he didn't know me from Adam, and uh, I was sitting somewhere in the middle of the room, and he said, you, preacher, right? I'm like, hey, I'm a preacher. What do you know? Uh, he says, you, and I, you know, I was the pastor of this church, and it was, I don't know, four or five years ago. I don't remember when it happened exactly. It could be three. It could be seven. I, I don't know. I, this is, I'm foggy on these things. And I was there, and he did call me out. Uh, it was at, uh, it was at uh, what was it at? New Dawn Church over in Coral Springs or wherever that is. Um, and so he says to me, preacher, uh, and I was like, yes. And he says, he says, the Lord is going to, he's going to, you're going to, the Lord's going to fill your house with miracles like in Mark chapter two, when they lowered the man from the roof. I'm like, that's a pretty good word. I'll take that one. I'm not shopping for words, but that's a pretty good word. I'll take that. 
right? And like I said, this wasn't just a guy who, you know, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a YouTube prophet. This, this is a, he's a real deal, right? So I was like, I'll take that. And we always um, believed him uh, healing here, and we've had healings. I'm, I'm super surprised by the miracles that we see already, but I'll take more. Amen. And I'll take bigger. And in, and in my mind, um, as I'm processing the word, the church will be filled because of the miracles. The miracles become so notable that the church will get, that's how I'm processing the word. And, you know, we we've, we've, we've see lots of healings, and I'm, and I'm pretty happy about them. But something in the word didn't perfectly resonate with me, right? And we talked about resonance, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Was it two weeks ago? Nah, it could be three. These things get foggy to me. I don't know if I told you that before. <laughs> the times all kind of meld together. Um, but I talked about resonance, and it didn't fully, like, I was like, that's a good word. But it wasn't like, yeah, that's, that's what we've been contending for, right? Uh, and so, but we believed it, and I shared it with our leadership team, and, you know, we pray for healing at every single meeting that we have, and we see people get touched all the time. And so this story has always uh, had a significance in my heart. But here, here's, here's, um, here's what happens. We fall into the trap of familiarization. And we can fall into the trap of over-familiarization in every area of our lives. Um, <clears throat> uh, what, the way I find it the most is people get over-familiar with their spouse, and they stop really appreciating what makes them unique because they're so familiar with it. And that's when the romance begins to die. It becomes some sort of utilitarian relationship. This happens with children. You get so familiar with your children, they don't bring you joy anymore because all you can look at are the duties and the tasks and what you have to do for them. And so this over-familiarization keeps you from really receiving. And as we read the Bible, we can become so familiar with the scriptures that they begin to lack power because we just start reading through the same things. And all of a sudden, we start thinking that just the act of reading the Bible will bring blessing as opposed to the Lord speaking out of the scripture, something that we haven't seen before. And so we can get super familiar with our family. We can get familiar with just anything in life that we can devalue uh, by getting too familiar. And unfortunately, since this becomes very common with God. We get so familiar with being a Christian that we just like forget like, oh yeah, I should be going to hell. But he saved me. Wow, that's, that's a pretty big deal. I, that's enough to be thankful for, you, right? So like we can be upset that we didn't get like the new rims we were looking for or the new purse or something stupid, like just some invitation, just like the dumbest things, being so familiar with God that we're disappointed in him, even though he rescued us from hell, right? Even though he's done all these miracles in our lives, we get so familiar. And so <clears throat> early in my walk, God um, very, very, very early began talking to me in visions. And uh, early in my walk, uh, when I would get these visions, I would have no idea what they meant, right? And so I would have to ask people, like, I have this vision. What does this mean? I don't know what this means. And as I became more um, knew God and knew his ways, I wouldn't have to ask people what they meant. They would be more clear to me. I would get them. But then I fell into the trap of being so familiar, familiar with prophetic visions that I stopped bringing them before other people to see what they might fully mean. I started relying on my own understanding. Does that make sense? And so I just became too familiar. And there's this German word, uh, which I'm going to butcher, and I'm just really hoping nobody in this room speaks German. Because uh, it's, 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 I believe the word is ostratine or ostratine. And, and, and what it, what, it's a concept. And this concept is that we uh, defamiliarize ourselves with things, right? Like we, 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 in, when you ostratine, that the process means that we see common things as strange or unfamiliar, or we defamiliarize what is known, hear me, in order to know it differently or more deeply, right? We want to defamiliarize ourselves with what is known in order to know it differently or more deeply. And what the goal is to grow in appreciation for it when we look at it anew, right? When we're in times of revival, all of a sudden we see Christ anew, right? We see him new and we fall in love all over again. So we got defamiliarized by the spirit. Then we see him in his glory as opposed to through our disappointment. And then all of a sudden he's beautiful again. Yeah. Right? This is, this, this is what happens. And so I knew this story in Mark chapter 2. You know, I read it who knows how many times. And, and um, you know, we, we, I've always believed that miracles would be part of what our church does. Um, but, but I had become so familiar with the story uh, that it lost the power of what God was trying to speak to me. And um, I want to do two things today, like I said. I want us to study 
this passage as an example of defamiliarizing ourselves with Scripture. Number one, so we can see partly as part of this is us to see what God has called this house to. That's my primary goal, to show you this is what God has called our house to. But number two, to maybe in a prophetic sense, prompt you to defamiliarize yourself with maybe some prophetic words that haven't come to pass yet or some callings that you may have received but you're not walking in yet or just maybe the relationships that God has around you. So I'm trusting that Holy Spirit will work as I'm teaching out of the scriptures, okay? You good? Well, let's start in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, and I'm just going to kind of go verse by verse here, all right? I'm not going to preach with a whole bunch of points, I'm just going to kind of talk about the scripture as we go through it. Let's look at the first verse here together uh, as we defamiliarize ourselves with this story. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was what? Let's say it together. It was heard that he was... Jesus was at home. That means Jesus had a house. So, so many people believe that, you know, the Son of Man, just like the foxes of the air and the birds of the air have no place, the Son of Man has no place to raise it. The Bible says he was at home. Jesus was not using like a, a couch surfing app, right, to get around. Like Jesus lived somewhere, right? He, he's a king of glory. He, he lived somewhere. He had a house. He had a base of operation. And uh, many times, I don't know how many times I have read that scripture and never saw that Jesus had a house. He had a place that he lived. It's in the Bible. We can get so familiar and say, well, Greek, it says at house. Pretty clear he was at home. Now, it's commonly understood that he lived there with uh, Peter and Andrew, as you can look in uh, Mark chapter 1, kind of makes reference. But he lived there. He lived at home. And so as we look at the scripture and say, wow, maybe, maybe in this story there's more that I have overlooked, I've become too familiar with, and if I would kind of unfocus and focus again, God can show me something. Can you, can you go on that journey with me? Yeah. All right. And so as we go on this journey, I am going to take some liberties in interpretation, right? There are things that we can see in the scripture that are not explicitly stated. Now, none of the things that I'm going to talk about today change any of the foundations or the orthodox beliefs of Christianity, right? We're not going to take any liberties with whether or not Jesus was fully God and fully man. We're not going to take any liberties with the method of salvation. We're not, we're not going anywhere crazy, all right? So just give me a little latitude today. Can you do that for me? Excellent. Thank you so much. So we see that Jesus was at home, and, 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 and let's go from there. Verse 2. And it says, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. First thing I want you to see here is the house was not filled because of the miracles. That's what the prophetic word said to me because that was my experience and my expectation. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that there was miracles, the house was empty, there was miracles, and then it got full right? The house was already full. Jesus was teaching, right? Because Jesus was there, the house was full, right? And and then it says, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, in in kind of the the days of Jesus, families, it wasn't like today where like I live in Boca, my mom might live in, you know, another part of town or, you know, another city or another state and You travel back and forth and see each other once in a while. By and large, families lived in a compound, right? They had a compound. They had some land. They had a little compound. And if someone had another child or someone got married, they'd just build another house or they'd extend the house, right? They would just extend it. There'd just be this growing compound. And yes, you know, people would pass and people would be born and they kind of lived in compounds. And, you know, people may have moved here and there, but by and large, people lived together. And so uh, we see the main job, the main role uh, a family were to take care of one another. Families took care of one another. There was no social network that took care of people. It didn't happen until there was Christianity and they started taking care of the widows. That, that was the Christians who started that. And down to even today, as you look around the world, you'll see Baptist Hospital or Memorial Hospital or you'll see uh, maybe Our Lady of whatever hospital. And you're not going to see any Nietzsche hospitals. You're not going to see any Buddhist hospitals. This is a Christian thing. It was, it was Christianity that started this, we are going to take care of the less fortunate. This, is, this, is, this, is, this was a, a Christian concept. Because back in the day, either your family took care of you or you died if you were sick. That, that, those are your options right there. There was no social 
safety net. But what we see here is very interesting. It says, and they came, no, go back. It says, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by his family? No, four men, four men. And if we were to take a little bit of liberty here, what should be done by a family is be done by four men. So we can maybe take the assumption here, and I think I can prove this later in the scripture, that his family had not actually taken care of him. You see, there was this stigma to having a birth defect. You remember the story of the, of the um, I think it was the boy who would have the seizures, and the, and the people would say, who was it who caused this sin? Was it his, who caused this sickness? Was it his parents' sin or his sin? There was this stigma on not being healthy, and they, famil- they, they, they equated this, uh, this, paral- this paralytic condition with having sin in your life, and it was like a stain on the family. And it wasn't a concept that we run to the hurting like we have in Christianity. It was a concept of, I can't have this stain. I can't have people avoid us. It will affect us financially. It will affect what, who our kids can marry. It will affect who will buy our goods. We can't have this. And so we can assume that this paralytic was abandoned by his family due to his condition. Because we have four men taking care of him, not his family. Verse 4. And so these people, it says, being unable to get to him, because, unable to get to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above Jesus. Now, I, don't, I, I, I would think that there would be more talk about that in the story. Like, like I, I don't know how many homeowners there are in there, but one of the worst things that can happen to your house is a leak. Right? That's one of the worst things that can happen to your house because once water starts getting in, everything gets destroyed. Once water, I mean, that's it. And so the way these houses were built, they had flat roofs and and most of the time, there was a, um, a stairs that go up to the roof, or maybe a ladder. Uh, but we can assume stairs that go up to the roof, and stuff happened on the roof. That was part of the living space. And there was um, thatched reed that was covered in mud, right? And so this roof was made out of thatched reed covered in a mud. That would make it hard. And, and animals would burrow into it. You know, there would be rodents and cats and just animals would, would, would kind of live within this mudded, thatched roof. This is where the saying, raining cats and dogs, comes from. When it would rain, and the roof would get a little soft, and these animals were trying to get out of the wet, and they would start falling into your house. It would be raining cats. It's raining so hard, they're avoiding it, and it's raining cats and dogs. That's, that's, that's where it comes from, which, I don't know, sounds disgusting to anybody else in this house. Thank you, Jesus, for modern construction. Amen? <clears throat> and so, the, so, so we see these guys, and it says here, it even proves it, it says uh, they, have, they, were, they, they dug an opening to lower this man down. So here's Jesus, and the guys are figuring out where Jesus is, and they dig a hole where Jesus is, and they let down the pallet. You know how big this hole must have been to lower a man on a pallet into a room? Again, I would think the story would talk more about that. And they were destroying Jesus' house (laughs) while he was trying to have a meeting. I don't know how many of you have preached a service before, but I ask people like my leaders, don't have conversations in the front while I'm having an altar call. I just, that's making it hard for me, right? Can you imagine if somebody right now was destroying our roof to lower people into the room, what might happen to the meeting? It might be difficult to get the crowd back as people are like, hmm, there's a person lowering from the ceiling. (laughs) They don't talk about it, though. So watch this, verse 5. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, something I want you to see here, there's several things, actually, as we're just kind of Taking a look through this uh, scripture here. The, in, what we see here is uh, what they call in literary um, uh, genres a hapex legomenon. Hapex legomenon. That means the one time that happens in the literary structure. Uh, what that means is this is the only place in all of scripture that Jesus called somebody son. This paralytic is the only man who is ever called son in the scriptures. I want you to see the significance of here. Here's a man abandoned by his family. 
the first thing Jesus says, to do, the first thing Jesus does is calls him son Amen. and brings him into family. Where he had been rejected and been ashamed of, they're calling him son. His illness was a shining light on their family as a, as a, as a, a, a smudge or an ugly mark. And Jesus is like, I'll associate myself with that. Before he healed him, before the man ever repented of anything, Jesus called him son. And he says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is interesting for two reasons. Number one, they believed that sin was the cause of this kind of sickness. And Jesus stands up and says, there's no sin here. Now, this offended some folks that Jesus said you can't, you can't discriminate against him because of his disability, thinking that it's a smudge on him. Uh, but also, nowhere in the, in, in, in the expectation of the Jews of the day did they think that the Messiah would come and forgive sins. The expectation was the Messiah would come and restore the kingdom. That was the expectation of the Messiah. And it wasn't even until after his resurrection that the church even really embraced the idea that he forgives sins, faith in Christ produces the forgiveness of sins. This came out of left field. All they know is there's only God can forgive sins. And the first thing Jesus did to this man was call him son and then tell him he no longer had sin. Fairly significant, I would say. Yeah? Let's take a look at, take a look at verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? It's important. Jesus didn't say that first. They said it. Only God can forgive sins, right? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? What's easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Pause. It was my idea. <clears throat> well, let me say it this way. The miracles are a sign. The miracles are not a sign that you have a great church. The miracles are a sign that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, right? And that he is the son of God, and he has the power over sin, sickness, disease. That They point to Jesus. They don't point to man. And so many of us preachers fall in the trap of thinking that our ministry is justified by what Jesus does. It's so easy to think, because I have this great revelation on this teaching, that this justifies my ministry, or because I can preach good, or because I have miracles, or because I'm seeing salvations, that we get, we get confused, and preachers, if you're honest, you have dealt with this, or it's time to get honest, that you've confused who gets the glory from these things. It's an easy, easy trap to fall into. And Jesus was making it very clear here, and we need to be very clear in this house, that the miracles point to Jesus. Every healing that we see in this house points to the fact that God is good. It doesn't point to the fact that our church is amazing. It doesn't point to the fact that we're super anointed. It doesn't point to the fact that we've made it important. It points to the fact that God is good. It points to the fact that Jesus Christ is worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be exalted. He is a worthy, worthy God, hear me, to serve and give your life to. The signs point to something greater than themselves, right? Verse 10, Jesus said, so that you may know, he's talking to the scribes now, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turned to the paralytic and said, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. Now, Jesus, the gospel, the miracles prove the gospel is true. Jesus said it right here. Well, how can this guy, only God can forgive sins. And he's like, okay, I'll take that. What's harder than forgiving sins? Healing bodies. Therefore, if I have healed a body, I have the power to forgive sins. I need you to hold on to that for a second. If I have the power to heal bodies, therefore I have the power to forgive sins. And so as I received this word, Mark chapter 2, where they lowered the man, all I saw was the miracle on the body. 
Let me show you something else here. He says to him, verse 11, let's take a look at 11. I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and do what? I want you to take your healing back to the people who rejected you. I'm not just trying to heal a man. I'm trying to heal a family. I'm trying to restore lives. I want you to, I know, I, like remember when the, the demoniac who was chained was set free? And he said, here, I want to follow you, Jesus. Jesus said, no, no, go back to your family. Now, this man had also been abandoned. He was chained in the forest. And Jesus said, go, go back to your family. Jesus tells this young man, no, 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 no. Right now, go back to your family. Bring this healing. Bring this forgiveness. I want to heal what has ailed all of you. I want your healing to bring healing to those who have abandoned you. That's a good word, right? Yeah. This is the call in your life, to share the story of your encounter and invite others to come encounter Jesus. This is the call in your life, to share the story of your encounter and invite others to encounter Jesus. Verse 12, let's take a look. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and glorifying God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. So there's a hole still in the roof. He doesn't even help fix. He just obeys Jesus and, and goes home, right? <clears throat> I want you to see yourself in the call on this house. And this, was, this can be very hard. This can be very hard for some people who feel like they have a very strong call. And they don't see how their call fits in with what's in front of them. Does this make sense? It's easy to say, yeah, but I'm called to that. Yeah, but I'm called to that. Yeah, but I'm called there. <clears throat> Corey Pagano has this saying that I am going to one day claim as my own if I say it enough and give him credit. He likes to say, uh, if you will do what's in front of you with all your heart, one day God will put what's in your heart in front of you. And it's important that as a house where we are not just called to see miracles, but we're called to see whole families restored to Christ. We're called to see all this healing. And if you will see yourself in the call on this house, then God will show your part of it enough to flourish and may one day send you off to do it on your own. See, your transformation is your ministry. Your transformation is is your ministry. See, the world without Christ, and unfortunately much of the world with Christ, they're, they're, they're ministering out of their open wounds. Also, let me say it this way. They're bleeding on everybody around them. They're carrying their offense, and they're getting their offense on everybody around them. They're getting their judgment and putting their judgment on everybody around them. They're getting their condemnation, and they're putting their condemnation on everyone around them. They're, they're, they're ministering out of their open wounds. They're bleeding on everybody. And as Christians, we, we are called to minister out of our scars. We're called to minister out of our scars. We're, we're called to not ignore the wound, either before or after it's healed. Christians like to act like we've never been wounded, like we got it all together, like we got it all figured out. Like, And we need to minister out of our wounds. We need to share our transformation. We need to point to Jesus and this is why I can be whole now. We're called to receive, embrace, and release a life of miracles in spirit, soul, and body. This isn't just a call to physical miracles. Maybe you feel called to physical, maybe that's like, that's the call in your life. Like all you can see when you get in those God moments, all you can see are just blind eyes opening and, 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 and the deaf hearing and in mass bones popping back together and backs being straightened. I'm not telling you not to dream that at all. I'm not telling you not to dream that at all. I, I, be, I, believe, I believe with you. But maybe, maybe, maybe when you look at ministry, you say, man, I just want to see these broken families get healed. I want to see them get whole. I want to see people not bleed all over everybody around them. I want to see people who actually can be happy in life, who can flourish in life. And I'm here to say, amen. Amen to your call. We need that. Maybe you just say, I just, I just want the harvest. Maybe you think the only thing that's important is the harvest and people just need to get saved and they can work out all that unforgiveness later and it's better to go to heaven with no eyes and go to hell with two eyes and I just want to see people get saved. I'm not telling you you have to devalue that. I value that as well and I'm telling you there's a place in this house for you. We need all three, amen? No, come on. 
And so I want to challenge you to be the best you you can be while honoring the whole picture of what God is doing. It took me defamiliarizing myself with this scripture to see the full call of God that he had released to me in this scripture. It wasn't just to see miracles, and it certainly wasn't to grow my ministry. The word of God was that people, I am called, and my church is called to be filled with people who are getting healed, spirit, soul, and body, and taking that healing back to their families. Now, I work and I preach a lot about uh, that you won't pass these generational things onto your kids, right? We work hard in that. And I believe that generational curses can be broken and generational habits can be broken. But it's my heart that in your healing, you'll take that healing both ways. That, that your children won't walk in it, but you can also bring back that healing back to your parents. You can bring it to your brothers and your sisters and your aunts and your uncles and that families can be restored. It can go both ways. And I'm truly praying for people who can believe this over their city. What, what I'm trying to say is, no matter what you think you have been called to, however you saw the vision when you first saw it, your call can be bigger than you thought it was. It can be bigger than you thought it was. It doesn't diminish what you saw, but you may not have seen the whole thing. Again, revelation is limited to our understanding, and so... A deep dive into the scripture expanded my revelation of, of what God was speaking to me through this scripture. And, and, and I didn't see what God had been talking about. And, and I want to share this with you humbly. I want to share this with you out of, out, of, out of my scar of now getting some healing and what this word meant. And I felt like God told me to tell this to so many of you today. You aren't missing it. You're in the process. Don't give up. Stay focused. Come on. You aren't missing it. You're in the process. Don't give up. Stay focused. I hope that you see yourself somewhere in this story. If you're dealing with a, a crippling problem, spiritually, soulishly, maybe emotionally, maybe physically, if you, if you, I hope you see yourself as that paralytic and that Jesus comes in and heals and Maybe if, if you saw yourself as the person who's always questioning, yeah, well, that looks a little too spiritual for me. Yeah, is that real? I pray that you could get unfamiliar with what you've grown skeptical of and see that God does still do these things and they're important. I hope that you can see maybe yourself as someone, and this is what I really hope. I hope you can see yourself as one of those four men who said just because this person's been abandoned by society and abandoned by their family, I will bring them to the house of God where I know Jesus is so that they can be restored and walk in their purpose. Amen. I'm praying that you can say, I have that power to change a life by bringing someone to where I know Jesus is. We have the same mandate eventually, ultimately, as the paralytic to carry our healing to this world and invite the world into the same. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. I thank you so much for your life. I thank you that you have healed me, spirit, soul, and body, and that I'm still being healed. I thank you that you didn't give up in the first year or two or the first decade or two in me, Father. I thank you that you're still suffering me, that you are still patient with me. You're still working on me, and I thank you that you're still using me. And I thank you that you're still speaking to me, even in places that I've missed it. I thank you that you're gracious. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would move on all of our hearts to see the abandoned, the hurting in this world, that we would see, we would see the broken who need you. If you stand with me, let me bless you before we go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless each one under the sound of my voice. And I pray right now, I pray right now that you begin to speak to their hearts and you would show them areas that it's just time to get refocused. And you would put in their hearts people who need to be brought and encounter God's love. In Jesus' name, amen. Holly, would you give it up for the word this morning? Come on, because God, God's word is truth and life, amen? He's doing something in our midst. You know that? I want to challenge you. 
this this week um, in light of you know what Pastor Carl just t- taught on the call of God in your life the promises that God has for you the maybe the prophetic words that you've gotten that have become a little too familiar yeah. I want to challenge you this week to to seek Jesus and, and just allow him to breathe new on those promises amen new perspective new perspective new understanding those things that have become stale that they'd be fresh again they'd be fresh again it's just a simple prayer just pray pray this Jesus make what's become familiar new again and watch as you pray that this week watch him meet you in it the same way he met Pastor Carl in, in that scripture and a whole new perspective and the second thing I want to challenge you on this week is to share your transformation Share your transformation. Share your transformation with the lost, with the hurting. Don't tell people what you think they need to hear. Just share what God's done in your life. And watch as you do that. He'll actually meet you in the first thing, and he'll make the promise fresh again. Amen. Amen. Can you give it up for Jesus one more time?